welcome to another episode of the Patricia J Show. On today's episode, we sit down with the rep king himself, rapper, executive, philanthropist from the T Dot. It's Cardinal Official. Right, the moment we've been waiting for. Thank you so much. My pleasure. For doing this for me, for us, for the community. Tell us, Cardi, how did it all get started? Oh man, it's a big loaded question. I know. I know. I mean, I can't really. I don't think I can really pinpoint um, a specific time because it's like for me, I didn't even realize um, that music was something that I was into that much. Uh, my dad, like I grew up with music. My dad. Um, when he was younger, was a DJ. Yeah. Yeah, he was called Soul Prince. Oh, nice. So, like, yeah, his record collection, like, all of, like, the, um, all of the middles, it would have Soul Prince on it. All so it's vinyl? like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's like, I grew up with music, so it's like, kind of like when you're surrounded by something from birth, you don't really realize, sure. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or get an idea or a gauge of, of how into it you are. Um, but I think I can kind of attribute, uh, first getting started, um, to somebody named Herman Ellis. Herman Ellis was a guy, he was one of the, I don't know what you would call them, I guess like a counselor, facilitator at the community center that we went to. So um, back when I was, I don't know, 13 maybe, yeah. um, he always saw us like just, you know, on our own, just organically, we would go to the center and we, you know, sign out one of the rooms and we just play music. We do dance routines and little, you know what I'm saying? Like do our little raps. And he always saw us like always just doing this just regardless, you know what I'm saying? Just for whatever. So there was this um, contest that was called the, the task, the mayor's task force on drugs. And they had this contest to where, uh, the, the person with the best anti-drug song would oh, win smart. would win this big competition. Anyways, we entered it and we ended up, you know, winning this citywide contest. It really, I guess, showed myself and my friends that I was I was in a group at the time that you know that we could that we could do this thing. And it was crazy because at that time, one of the grand like the grand prize was that you'd be able to perform uh, at what is now the Molson Amphitheater. Yeah. And wow. um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. And also, you know, Maestro was one of the judges at the time. And you have to understand at that time, he had gone like double platinum, you know what I mean? So like, it was a it was a massive deal like for little kids to like be put into this situation. We got to be on much music yeah. and performed on, you know, at the time breakfast television, you know what I'm saying? Like all so this- the community yeah, center, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that little room, mm -hmm. you're now on the big stage on the big with a godfather of Canadian hip hop. Yeah, like it was it was literally a really electric time, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like for us, it was our first, I think that was probably, you know, my first taste of being able to perform for, I'd say a big crowd like that. It's interesting, like I kind of skipped over, there's so many different things that happened in my life. Like I was able to perform for Nelson Mandela when he was released and that was before that, but it was a different type of show, you know what I'm saying? Like this was really uh, the first time that we were able to perform for the GP and I mean the general the general public and having Maestro be involved and um, yeah it was it was just a really a really awesome time. You know you got an eclectic sound, a very original sound. When do you make that breakout though from your boys in the community center in that little group just having fun mm -hmm. to actually becoming Cardinal Official V artist and I used to be a part of a crew that's called the circle and the circle had myself Socrates right. Julie Black just all these you know Shaw Claire all of us used to used to work together and right. we, we used to pool our ideas pool our creativity and pool our money together and that's how it saw the success of each of us as individuals so you know when it was Shaw Claire's turn and he got his deal with Virgin and then priority in the States all of us pulled together our beats, our ideas, whatever, and we and we pushed Shaw Claire. And you know, he had it's gold amazing. albums and got to work with, you know, got to work with everybody. Same thing with Socrates. Um, he was actually, it's a little known fact, he was actually the first to get signed out of all of us. He got signed in, wow. yeah, and like we were still in, in high school. He got signed in 95 to Warner Brothers LA. 
time. So yeah, wow. so we saw, you know, we saw a lot of fun times with him too. But really, you know, even though I was solo, we always worked as a crew and a collective back in those times. And um, that's what made, made it so comfortable. And I think why we were able to keep a certain frame of mind, because what you have to understand is, and I'm dating myself, which is fine, okay. looking at the camera, <laughs> but um, it's one of those things to where, like, you have to understand this is pretty much pre-internet, social media, that whole nine yards. So it's like now, like the two of us could literally go upstairs, go make a song, press click, and yep. the world is like, oh my God, did you hear the new Patricia Prodig Jane Cardi song? <laughs> but back in those times, literally, like we had to physically carry our music to places. You know, we went everywhere. Like, you know, when we used to go to, uh, I remember I did a show with the Rascals and Barrington Levy wow. in London. Like, I literally had to pack my suitcase with our vinyl Vinyls, and yeah. bring it over there. Like, you know, when we had to go be on the Sway and King Tech show in the Bay Area, yeah. we had to lift everything. And if we wanted to give somebody our music, we had to physically either ship it to them or like, you know, yeah, yeah, do it hand to hand. So it's one of those ones where it's like, um, in order to break through at those times, like you had to go a thousand times harder mm -hmm. than now. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Like we made it um, to where it's easier now for, for this generation to be able to do what they gotta do and what they wanna do. You know what I'm saying? Because it's thing, like- A good thing, you think? That's a good thing? It depends on their mentality. Okay. Because for us, we had to be driven. We had to yeah, be very driven. We had to be passionate. Um, patient. We had to be, well, I don't know if we had patience. <laughs> um, but we, your patience just wanted to happen, right? I mean, you know what it is? It's like, it's hard to imagine right now because it's like we have so many different examples now. It's the same way that like kids grew up with Barack Obama, like kids that are, you know, were born like within the last whatever, 10 years. Mm -hmm. So all they know about is they're like, what do you mean a person of color can't be president? Of course they can, and like that's all they, they know, they but they don't know what happened prior to that. So it's the sure. same way that now we have everybody like from Alessia Cara, Weekend, Drake, Bieber, Shawn Mendes, it just keep going on like yeah. it goes on and on forever. So they're like, what do you mean Canadian artists can't be the biggest artists <laughs> in the world? But we were literally existing at a time where outside of like maybe Nelly Furtado, Bare Naked Ladies, mm -hmm. Celine Dion, mm -hmm. You could count them on one hand. There weren't really many different examples of internationally successful Canadian musicians. Never mind the urban industry. You know what I'm saying? Like people doing black music, not at all. Like everywhere we travel, they kind of look at us like, like in Aladdin when he had when he found a lamp. Like everybody's like, "What is this lamp?" He dusts it <laughs> off. You're like, "I never knew that the genie could happen." Right. Like that's how they looked at us, like some kind of crazy freaks of nature. Right. But that was really. Um, that was really what, what we wanted to do. Like myself, Shaw Claire, and Socrates for the most part were the three that used to go everywhere and we used to just obliterate everything. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's yeah, man, like we killed it. Like right before I signed, um, I signed my first deal, I was number one across all of the college, the U.S. college charts, the, the U.S. independent charts, like pretty much everything that you went to, it said, you know, number one was Cardinal with the Hustling EP or whatever. So it's not something to where like I got this random fluke thing to where somebody just saw me one night at a show and was mm. like, we're going to give him a shot. Nah, like we had to put in our work. And it's like, after we were number one, they were like, they, it, it was undeniable. So that's when I got, you know, my first deal with MCA Records. You also brought dance hall, you brought the reggae, you brought the Caribbean mm -hmm. into this mainstream artist that you became and are, still are. Mm -hmm. How did you find, because I feel you were the only one doing that kind of style when you started, but it resonated and it's stuck. Mm -hmm. You cross stateside, you cross into pretty much globally, mm -hmm. and people who can't even speak English are singing your song. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so for me, uh, originally, it wasn't really something I was cognizant of because uh, it was just something that I did because to me, music has always been supposed to be an extension of who you are. Yes. So I was the first person to be born in, you know, in Toronto. Like my family came here from Jamaica. So Your first generation. Yeah, yeah. So it's like growing up. Um, and the culture of your of your family is what you're used to. Like that's just who I who I was. So it's like that sound just made sense to me. And then it's like I was influenced by people 
like from stateside people like Heavy D, KRS One, other people that used to like um, kind of inject Caribbean music mm -hmm. into their their brand of hip hop. But then also from here, I remember being a little kid and I remember like Mishy Me coming to my neighborhood. Like when I was young, I used to live in Flemington Park. Yeah. And I remember she came there and you know she was filming part of a video there. And it's like I remember like. Mishy sound just felt very familiar to me, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, it was just a natural thing. And I think by the time I came out and I was I was big, I was filling a void. Cause there's always kind of been like, if you go back, um, hip hop is something that originated from dancehall music, you know what I'm saying? So when you look at people like Cool Herc, who was literally credited as the first person to create that whole hip hop sound. That's something that he just brought from Jamaica when he came to the Bronx. That's what he knew. Exactly, so I think for me, it's kind of the same thing. And I think at that time, there was a real void, you know? Like there, there weren't a lot of people that were doing that at that time. So it's not that I was the first, but at that time there was so much spotlight on it, it, w it became fresh again. You know, the same way everything is a cycle, the same way like, you know, a few years ago, Rock City and um, Adam Levine came out with, um, came out with their song yeah. and it's like it blew it because did. at that time there was a void and then you know obviously people like Drake and others that started to kind of have that Caribbean influence be in their music yeah. again it kind of brought it back to the mainstream because again those people that succeed are the people that can uh, easily identify voids or a need within whatever genre or profession it is that they're doing so just like we're doing this show is because we need you and we need shows like this to exist and it's the same thing honestly but it's the same thing that happens within music is it's like those people that succeed are the ones that feed what the fans want and I think at that time um, people were so excited and people were so hyped you know what I'm saying yeah, to have totally. this music that they didn't even realize that they were familiar with, but they needed to be re-familiarized with the music. And I think that's why at that time I went on to work with, like literally like when I came out with Bacardi slang, which to me again was just regular, that's a regular, but it was regular stuff because it's like, even the, the conversation around Bacardi slang was just like, this is how we talk in Toronto and this is just who we are. But I was like, my mandate was I was like the same way people used to big up Brooklyn, LA, exactly. wherever they were from. I wanted at that time, I was like, yo, Toronto has to be part of that conversation. Cause it's like, I remember one of my favorite songs from MC Light. It's a more of an album cut, but it's a song called Kick This One for Brooklyn. And I just remember growing up and singing that, but I was like, we don't have anything that reps where we're from. So that's why for me, like Bacardi slang was such a big thing. And in the hook where it literally, the apex of the hook is everybody knows it's the T dot. Like I would travel the world and people, huh? everybody knows it's the, the T dot. But that's the thing is like, people used to think that that was my name. Like I remember I went to the Billboard Awards Wait, for the first, went to the Billboard Awards <laughs> for the first time. Okay. And I'm there with my friend and I hear from across the room, T dot. And I'm like, <laughs> Who is that? Yeah. And I see this person with the craziest walk okay. and the shiniest, most colorful suit, and it's Shaba. Oh my God. And Shaba's like, Shaba. Sha yeah, yeah, Shaba's like, yo, T dot, blah, blah. And he's talking to me like my name is T dot, -Dot. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like the first, the first couple of years was kind of an education period to where I was right. like, this is what T dot O dot is. It's just, you know, an abbreviated uh, ac acronym for Toronto, that. Ontario. But, um, you know, at the time people didn't know that. So it's like, I literally, there's very few places I haven't been. Like I've been to China, Romania, Spain, France, wherever. And it's dope, you know what I'm saying? To be able to have like that be a part of my story and a part of what my legacy is was like, introducing to many people for the first time what Toronto is like, what our energy is like, you know what I'm saying? And, and the capabilities that we have. Your sweetest moment of your career, Cardi. The moment that you realize, I am not Jason R, I am Cardinal Official. The world is giving me love and I was meant to do this. This is my destiny. When did that happen for you? You know what's interesting? I have two trains of thought with that and one overpowers everything else so I don't even pay attention <laughs> sometimes people buy into their hype too much okay. and when when you allow yourself to uh, exist only as a cardinal or when that is the only thing that's driving you yeah. um, 
within everybody's time because it happens with I remember you know it happens with Michael Jackson like nobody ever thought Michael Jackson would cool off right. but everybody has a cool period where they got to get it together and go back up <laughs> when Oprah you know quit her show and you know her magazine and her TV show wasn't taken off people are like oh man Oprah's done at the end of the day when you use that to fuel who you are I think it can be a little bit damaging so for me it's always a reinvention um, but it's also like remembering to not have that balloon be filled with helium okay. you know what I'm saying because eventually like when the helium goes away you know what I'm saying it just falls down for me if I'm trying to build a balloon I'm trying to build a structure that will always hold that balloon in place yes. so that even when that helium goes away it's still up there but it's like being able to diversify who you are and never let yourself be pigeonholed and never let yourself get too comfortable within what you do because I think uh, the biggest, the, the thing that'll fuel creatives is the challenge, is that that want and that drive. And I think when you get comfortable doing something, it can stifle your creativity and it can, you know what I mean? Like, I just think at the end of the day, me being able to challenge myself is is what is gonna always keep, uh, keep me pushing forward. For me, it's the only reason why I've been able to, to um, maintain my visibility i think internationally is not just limiting myself to just being that you know being just that rapper you know and i think that's what's cool about in terms of my artistry like the next step the next album that i'm working on mm -hmm. is an album where i am producing all the music and then featuring other artists so it's cool because people are like i didn't even know that you could produce but i think that's what's amazing is it's like being able to still do what i'm passionate about but at the same time challenging myself and also opening people's eyes to the other skills that you have that you might have just had tough you know what i'm saying until that right moment Wait till yeah, right. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely right. that's absolutely what you're doing. Yeah, yeah you go back to rep i love that acronym mm -hmm. rapper executive philanthropist mm -hmm. i actually saw i went to we day last year mm -hmm. and i saw you hype up those kids at the acc <laughs> <laughs> and it's just you just bring an energy an mm -hmm. energy to this room today an energy to the ACC that holds what, 20, 30,000 people? And mm -hmm. those kids were in there that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on this WE movement now with your philanthropy. I know you're doing so much more. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the WE movement. How did you get started with that? I know your whole crew is involved with that as well. Uh, talk to us about that. Um, so, years ago, mm -hmm. I got a call to be a part of um, Kanon's Waving Flag remix that he did. Jeez. And there was a I don't know how many artists that were all in Vancouver and um, we were all there to record our parts and so forth mm -hmm. and uh, these these guys like said they had wanted to talk to me and about something whatever it is and I'm like all right cool whatever and they brought me a you know they brought me to the side and they're like yo we want to tell you about you know this organization that we're a part of called free the children and the thing is no knock against charities but a lot of the time you're like Another one. Another one. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, shouts to DJ Kylie. But um, <laughs> it's just like, you get so you get so many requests, so many different things, so many different people that want you to be a part of their charitable organization. But one thing that, as a celebrity that I've learned is, there's a lot of charities that raise a lot of money and don't necessarily see that money going to where it's supposed to exactly. go. So, you know, you become weary and you become really suspect. Like, you, you know, you do the squint when people mm. are giving their pitch. You're like, I don't know. Right, right, like, what are you doing? But these guys, you know, th at the time they were working with uh, Kanon and, and Saul Guy, which is a good mm. friend of mine. And I was like, well, those people have great energy. So if, if you're cool with them, then I'm, I'm cool with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was an inadvertent cosign. Nice. And I became, I think, a part of their, you know, one of the earlier, one of the earlier Wee Days. And I think I performed that one and I was like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe then the following year I performed again, but what happened was they had offered me the opportunity to go to Kenya. What I like about their philosophy when they go into these communities, they only stay there for a certain amount of time and then they're able to, to withdraw from that community so that it's self-sufficient and there's a new stability, you know what I'm saying, to where they can basically take care of themselves. It's not something where they become dependent okay. on you or your organization. 
and I, I, I love what it is. It's not really a handout, but it's a, it's a help out. It's, it's empowerment. And I think at the end of the day, that's super important for me. You know what I mean? Is to be able to, to give back when and where I can, because sometimes our schedules get so hectic, uh, we may not be able to give back the way that we'd like to. But I think um, what's great about the WE organization and, and them working together with my wife and I mm -hmm. is, uh, we find the, 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 the sweet spot, as you would say, the, the sweet spot in terms of um, I'm able to do what I do, um, but very effectively find the pockets of time to give back and give back in a real way, a way that people can go home and feel that um, their time with me or their time with my crew or their time with the organization really had an effect on, on their lives and, and that it helps them grow. I remember understanding that that music can like totally penetrate barriers that you didn't even know existed. existed. One of the biggest show, not, not one of the, the biggest show that I ever did in terms of physical people being there was we had a show in, uh, in Malaga, which is in the south of Spain. And it was myself at the time, the Pussycat Dolls, nice. and then whoever their local big star was in Spain. And what's weird is sometimes in Europe they do these reverse shows to where the biggest artist will go on first so the and the uh, opener goes last. Yeah. Oh. Super weird to me. Okay. But obviously at that time, without question, you know, the, the local guy, he was bigger than both of us. Obviously, Nicole Scherzinger and the Pussycat Dolls yeah. were massive. Huge. And then I just had like my first real international hit at the time. Mm -hmm. So I had to go last. Oh, no. 300,000 people wow. showed up. And I was like, hearing the cheer of 300,000 people, it's not the same as like 10,000 or wow. even the ACC or 300,000. Not, it's weird. And what's interesting is out of those 300,000 people, I'm sure that English was not the first language for <laughs> most of them. Yeah. But what's crazy is they were all kind of singing yeah, along, go you know what I mean? And it's like, when you see that, and you know, like where, like I made that, you know, I made my first big, big international, like super, super hit was obviously dangerous, but I know that me and Akon did that in a very small room in a tour bus in Vancouver. In a tour bus? Yeah, like Timberland has a studio in his tour bus. So at the time we were on tour with Gwen Stefani, mm -hmm. so we were recording on the road. But it's like this hot box, like, Akon loves everything Africa hot inside the studio. <laughs> like, it's gross. Like, he'll be in it's like gross. a jacket and everybody else will be in like, you know, a wife beater and like their boxers, cause it's just, just disgusting. He's like, I love this. But knowing how that song was made and then seeing you know where you know where it was able to travel it's to it's crazy huge so dangerous was your big first big international track mm -hmm. as we mentioned like all kinds of people who have all types of tongue can't even speak the english language are singing your song mm -hmm. i want to know about how akon came to you there's a story in there about Jay-Z and Akon. And mm -hmm. you divvied off to Akon and chose to make your music and your legacy, if you will, about making music with Akon as opposed to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that choice and what it was like. Well, absolutely no shots whatsoever to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jay, at that time, this is 2005, he was at a transitional point in his career to where, um, I think he was at Def Jam, yeah, he was the president of Def Jam at that time. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a little bit of a tie-in with, um, with Rihanna because the person that discovered her from here, mm -hmm. not Toronto, but from North America, um, is a, you know, a friend of mine, Mark Jordan, who okay. previously had worked at Columbia Records and then left Columbia and when he left, he was kind of like trying to find himself. So he was traveling and different things. And I remember him calling me one day in studio and he's like, yo, I found this little girl. She's beautiful. She wow. can sing, whatever. And he's like, I was like, oh, what's her name? And he's like, her name is Rihanna. And I was like, what kind of name is that? That's not, it's like, that's a, that's a super Caribbean name. So I'm like, that's not gonna go anywhere. Talk to me when you find the real name for her. But anyways, He's like, yo, um, you know, she's amazing, but 
uh, I need you to jump on a couple of these demos that, that we did because I have a meeting with Jay-Z in two weeks, so I need you to jump on some of the demos. So I think I might have jumped on like three of them. And we all know the story of like they went to play the demos and they locked the doors and you know they did the deal within 24 hours. Yes. And I remember him hitting me and he's like, yo, we, get, we got the deal and they want to use um, one of the demos that you did that, that year on. I, I can't even remember what the song is called. That's a shame. I think it's called Rush or you can sing it something. Yes. I don't even know how that song goes. It's <laughs> super random. But yeah. um, the point is I met Jay-Z when he came up here. Yeah with Rihanna and Tierra Marie mm -hmm. at the time, because he came up here during Caravana. And I remember I met him and, you know, he was like, yo, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, taking part in the whole Rihanna thing. In my brain, I'm like, you're thanking me, bro? Like, sure, no problem, Jay-Z. But <laughs> anyways, his manager had, had reached out to my manager at the time, shouts to Mr. Morgan, and uh, they were like, yo, Jay-Z is going to do this show, this outdoor show, and he wants you to be a surprise guest. And I was like, cool, whatever, like, no problem. So I remember I came out and, at, like, just, told, it's still online, like, just killed it, like, yeah. destroyed it. Jay wasn't supposed to perform, but him him and Kanye ended up performing because they're like, no way, he's yeah. not he's not gonna do this at our event. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember, like, I was like, he's performing like out of nowhere. He's like, yo, do you have my my instrumentals? And but um, I remember it's funny, like on stage, Jay Brown went over to my manager and was like, yo, Jay wants to offer you guys a deal. And it was in jest at the time. They were throwing some numbers around, but there was a real, at the time, like there was a real offer to where like, um, you know, there was an opportunity to possibly sign with, can't remember what the, he's gone through so many, was, I think it was Rock La Familia at the time, okay. which they were just building. But at the same time, Akon was somebody who I met through a friend of mine, uh, Kirk, that worked for, he was one of the heads of international for Universal. And he was kind of in charge of Akon's international career. Okay. So I had done a song with, Akon and I used to see him traveling around the world like we'd always bump into each other so he had wanted me to be a part of this thing he was starting called convict music so it's like what do you do do you go with the established powerhouse or do you go with the new energy who's now like starting to make all this noise and remember at that time he had done this big song with young Jeezy that was uh you know soul survivor that was just killing right. everywhere so me, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, and I remember I prayed to God because I had no idea. That's a hard choice. Zero idea of what I wanted to do. Was, do you go with Akon? Do you go with... I don't know. And uh, he flew me to Atlanta, and he picked me up from my friend's house, and we went to Studio Akon, I'm talking about. Yeah, Akon. And we were just very similar in, like... We've always, to this day, we've always been very good with each other, like good friends. It's good and it's never been out of, I think, most of the artists that he's ever worked with, me and him always clicked because I didn't really ask him for anything. And uh, I've always had the mentality to where I wanted to earn everybody's, I wanted to earn everything by like showing them how hard I worked, showing them how dedicated mm -hmm. I was. And I think Akon was, was really appreciative of that to where it was kind of like, he looked at it as a partnership more than like him signing me and doing me a favor, you know what I mean? So the energy just felt right with, with Akon and I loved what he was doing and where he was going and the vision. He just released T-Pain, I'm Sprung at the time. And um, you know, we went to studio and you know, he doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. Um, so it was just, the vibe felt good. And just I was just like, you know what? I was like, yeah, I wanna go with, I wanna go with Akon. Now the funny thing that I've probably never said in an interview before was, first two years were tough because in that in between time, while I had dedicated myself and said, I'm gonna rock with Akon, mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of money coming in at those times because it's like, you kind of have to sacrifice what you're doing for this new movement. And exactly, and it's like, yeah, so the money was rough. And it's like, I, I hit a real rough patch, um, but it's interesting, it was through that adversity, that's where Dangerous was born. You know what I'm saying? That was literally the last song for the last show of a tour that we were on, where I wasn't getting paid any money, mind you. I was just out there and I was like, yo, this is, this is something, but literally the very last show, which was Vancouver of this North American tour. And it's like, 
after this, everybody's flying home. So I'm like, something's got to come out of this. Right. And, um, you know, Chemo from the Rascals had produced that song. Mm -hmm. And he sent it to me. And I said to Exit, who was the engineer. So mind you, I didn't even have a hotel room. So I used to have to sleep oh, on the sleep. tour bus. Oh. So I was able to shower in a hotel. Okay. But I actually didn't even have my own room at that time. So I remember I said to, um, wow. to Exit, I said, I need you to play this music for Akon. I need you to play it for him because I think he can kill it. And I went, took a shower, and I came back and Akon was in the studio. Yeah. And they were just silent. Like they were just in there. I guess they were talking. And I said, yo, Exit, did you play the song for Akon? And Akon's like, play what song? So Exit's like, now nah, play it for him right now. So he plays it, you know, it comes in. Doop, 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 doop. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, huh? Ah, ah. And Akon's like, you know, he's oh, like, whatever. Well, listen. So I'm like, huh. So maybe 20 seconds goes by and he's not reacting at all. But then all of a sudden I just heard the hook. Girl, I can't know. While I went to shower, he heard it and immediately wrote the hook. Like really? they got that done, like written, recorded everything within 20 minutes. <laughs> so by the, yeah. So by the time I came back, like it was already in place. So then I wrote my part. So that technically that song was done in less than an hour. Okay. What's your part again? Go ahead. Huh? I mean, I'm trying to get it. I know you're trying to get it. I know you're trying. I was like, for a minute there, I was like, what's I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, but literally the verses, like, yeah. you know, the verses were like, just came to me like super quick. And that song, uh, at the time, I was like, it's a pretty good song. And I remember maybe song. two weeks after the tour, uh, one of my managers came to my house and he's like, yo, so what did you guys do on tour? And I was playing him all these songs. Then I played him that song and he looked at me crazy like, <laughs> How long have you had this song? I was like, I don't know, two, three weeks. He's like, this is, this is crazy. And I guess I didn't initially realize it. I just thought it was a great song, yeah. but that was the key to like, you know, my next situation, you know, signing with Jimmy Iovine and Interscope and all of that. So yeah, man, like those, you know, those times again, it was very, it was a lot of fun but it also built up a lot of character, you know what I'm saying? And it, and it taught me, it taught me a whole lot. And one thing that Akon really taught me was like, he's like, yo, North America's cool, mm -hmm. but he's like, make sure you focus on international because the globe is really where it's at. Mm. Oh my gosh, what a story. Yeah, and that's 10%. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get you to spit it though, because my favorite line is, "Oh, you're that turtle, a little dog trying to get a little kick in the perk." I mean, this is great. This is, I mean, people hear me say it all the time. This is great seeing you do it. Can we do it together? You can. We can do it together. Yeah. Hold on, I gotta remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah that's her, the big dog trying to get a little kick. You stopped. <laughs> Come on, you gotta keep going. <laughs> okay. Three. X man looking at me like a Lucifer because yeah. he knows I would deal with the case. Yes, sir. Ah, <laughs> see, that's all we. That's all we need. We spoke so much off camera and on our set today about your legacy. Mm. When all is said and done, Cardi, what do you want people to remember you for? You know what? I think at the end of the day, it's interesting because the other day somebody hit me up. They're like, yo, you got to see this Party Next Door interview that he did. Yeah. And I think he did an interview with Nardwar. Nice. And, um, you know, he was like, he, I never met Party yet, but Party um, thanked me for like showing them that it's possible. You know what I'm saying? Like showing them that, you know, being an international star was was actually a reality. And I think, you know, early, you know, early out, like I remember a couple of times Drake had said the same thing. Like he's like, yo, the first star that I saw that was local, um, like meaning like was from where he was from was me. Like he, I don't remember what he's talking about, but he was like, there was a day that I was in Yorkdale Mall or something. Yeah. And like he saw all these people like, asking for autographs and whatever whatever and he's like yo like it was the first time that he saw somebody where he was from wow. be able to make it and i think at the end of the day for me just being able to um to do what i'm passionate about but show the generation that comes after me that everything is a possibility Cardi, thank you so much you said it best my you're pleasure it. you're a rapper you're an executive you're a producer repping the t-dot Cardinal Fischel, thank you so much for being on. The my Patricia pleasure, Show. my pleasure. You talk so much about social media, and we at the Patricia J Show are so socially savvy. So please use our hashtag, the Patricia J Show, so we can continue to ignite this conversation. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for watching the show. I know you loved it. We'll see you next time. Bye. Yes, my friend. <laughs>